test. Okay. I hate being so far away from everybody. I guess can't be helped a little bit. Tonight, um, I know some of your names. I'm getting to know some of you, but I just wonder if we could take a minute and have you go around and tell me your names again, and uh, it'll it'll help me, and then we can feel more connected too. So, uh, Anthony. Anthony Phillips. Anthony. Okay. Lina Salinas. Lina. Robert Salinas. Roberto. No. George. Yeah, George. Okay. Nancy Anderson. Uh -huh. Okay. Sandy Martinez. Okay. Mary Martinez. Okay. You, sir? Teal Osborne. Teal, okay. <laughs> Rita Gonzalez. Rita. And then I think you all know my wife. Glennis. Glennis. Okay. And I'm Ken. And this evening, we're going to just try to go in the word together. I don't want this to be a real formal time. Uh, I have a lot of material to cover. I don't know if we'll make it all. But uh, I did want to uh, just tell you that I'm happy to be here and, and get to, to share tonight. If you have questions, we can't get off. Sit there like bumps on a log. You can, yeah, like that. <laughs> so. Okay, so to get started tonight, what I would like to do is uh, take just a few minutes to think about the concept of orientation. And uh, everywhere we go as human beings, we don't realize we do it, but we're always orienting ourselves. You did it tonight when you came in, but you weren't aware of it. When you walk in a room, you look, you look around, and uh, you, you saw tables, you saw chairs. And because you then had information that you needed, you knew where to go sit. You thought, okay, I'm going to go to that table. I'm going to go sit over there. You were orienting yourself. And whenever we travel, we do this also. So I put up an example of a, of a map. And uh, maps are something that give us direction, aren't they? If you go on a trip, you want some direction, how to get there. A map shows us how to get to where we want to go. But... Maps do something else, and I just, as I thought about this study and was putting it together, I realized that there's something even more basic that they can do that I had never really thought of before, and that is maps help us know where we are. I mean, that's kind of profound, but it's pretty simple, too. When you look at a map, you lots of times think about, okay, where am I because I want to go somewhere else. So maps are something that help us to know where we are. And we do this a thousand times a day, don't we? Go on a trip, come in a room, go to a store, whatever we're doing, whatever we're doing we orient ourselves. Now, why do you think we do this? We don't have to think about it. Why it's automatic. But why do we do that? Why do we need to do that? We want to know where we are. You want to know where you are? Yeah, your brain... Yeah, your brain's getting information, isn't it? Because just think if you had no orientation around you. You know, this is what happens to people if, if they're blind and they're... they're interested in needing to have... Let me turn this little thing off here. Yeah, okay. So orientation is real important. And uh, the reason I'm talking about this right now is because tonight we're going to start exploring some really important major topics in the Bible that are going to help us get oriented as Christians. All of us that have come to the Lord, we know we're part of something great because God's touched our lives and he's, he's done something to, to change us. But... Lots of times we don't really know the big picture. We don't know how we fit in. And it's really important that we are oriented in God's word and as Christians because it helps us know where we're at. It helps us know who we are. It helps us know where we're going. Um, let me uh, orient you a little bit on what we're going to be doing here in the next 
couple of weeks. Tonight we're going to be talking about God's blessing. Okay? And you might just think, oh, blessing, yeah, we're blessed. But I'm telling you what, we don't hardly have any idea of how much we're blessed and what it means to have God's blessing on our lives. And then next week, Lord Happy, we're going to be talking about God's glory. Not just his glorious being, but the fact that we live for his glory. We live to glorify him. And that's something that I don't think a lot of us have a, a, enough grasp of. And after that, we're going to be talking some about God's kingdom. It's so important that we as Christians understand we are part of God's kingdom. You know, we have this church world we live in. We have all, all the different things around us that some, sometimes it's just religious things. And, but we're part of God's kingdom. God's kingdom. Where we fit into God's kingdom that we're part of. And then the fourth week, uh, we're going to change a little bit, and I'm going to talk about what if you had never heard. And I'm talking about the gospel. I'm talking about the blessing that comes through Jesus Christ. What if you and I had never heard? So I won't tell you any more about that, but in a few weeks we're going to get to that. So let's let's talk some about, well, I did want to make this point, that without being oriented in the things of the kingdom of God, we, we don't know who we are. And that has to do with identity. And we don't know where we are. That has to do with orientation. And we, uh, we don't know where we're going. And that has to do with purpose. And it has to do with destiny. By the way, we did hand out a little... Uh, paper to you. We're going to be seeing the answers here on the screen and talking about them, but also uh, feel free to write on these. You can take them home and think about some of the things that you've heard about tonight. Okay, so our goal over these next four weeks is to help ourselves as God's people to become better oriented and understand fully or at least more than we did before, God's purposes and his purposes for our lives. Did you know God has purposes? I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but God has some very definite purposes of things that he's doing and wants to do. And we're going to be looking at that. Uh, believe it or not, to actually begin to better understand who we are as Christians and what God's plans and purposes are as Christians, we have to go back in time 4,000 years. If we had a time machine, we could do it, but we're just going to have to use our imaginations tonight to do it. But we have to go back 4,000 years to a place on the other side of the world. It's a real place. It's in a country that we now call Iraq. And uh, it's a place where a man named Abraham used to live. You've all heard of Abraham. But Abraham... In himself, he's nothing. He's just like we are. He just was a normal person that lived in a place at a different time. He spoke a different language. He's a different culture. But God did something in Abraham's life that not only transformed Abraham, it, it, it's something that has changed the entire world. And the thing that I want to show you tonight that God told Abraham and started doing with Abraham actually is part of the reason that we're sitting in this room tonight. Think of that. Something that happened 4,000 years ago on the other side of the planet to a guy that's been dead for 40 centuries. Totally different. I don't know what the effect's going to be. But God did something for Abraham that is absolutely one of the most important events in all the world. I'm thankful that God had it recorded in the Bible because everybody, every Christian should know about what we're going to talk about. Okay, let's look at it. Now, what's really interesting, and if you were here Sunday, I showed this slide, and 
mention that a lot of people think the gospel is something that's just like the New Testament times. But it's not. The gospel is something from the Old Testament. It's fulfilled in the New Testament. But the gospel, and this is not just my idea. If you don't believe me, believe this guy. Paul, the apostle, wrote this. And he said, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. And here's what God said to him, all nations will be blessed through you. Now you might have known what the, you thought, you might have thought that you knew what the gospel was. When someone, if someone were to ask you, what, what's, what do you think the gospel is? What would you tell them? And you'll be right. There will be a lot of answers that are part of it. What, what would you say? Good news. It's good news, okay. Yeah, if someone were to ask you what is the gospel, what would you tell them? Very simple. That God loves all of us and we are God's children. Okay. Through time, we tend to see, we tend to lose ourselves because we become very greedy. Yeah, that's and true. And nothing really matters. People don't get it to their head. That's true. Very simple. We know we pay tax and we know we die. Very simple. If you believe in Jesus, Jesus is yours, and he says, I am the way. Mm -hmm. I am the truth and the life and the resurrection. Mm -hmm. He that believes in me will never die. Mm -hmm. So automatically there's gonna be another like this seminar, but I'm gonna call it it's beautiful. But we're so afraid. Look at what happened. We knew when it was about to come. Uh -huh. And I already died once. They brought me back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know, and I've already seen Jesus. I didn't have a reason why to, but I did. Mm -hmm. I lost my wife and my son in a car accident. Yeah. And I got angry with Jesus, or God or my whatever. Because all now I know is that God has a purpose to do what we have to do and have our children and love and do but we're constantly fighting amongst ourselves. What happened like you said in Abraham time? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what was it? Uh, Afghanistan or, or Syria? What was the place that you said? Iraq. 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 Mm -hmm. And the most beautiful place that where Jesus was born there's been the most bloodshed ever. Yeah. Well, the enemy is very interested in that place. That's why he wants to do it. Okay, now, everything you said, you said it was good news. Um, anybody else add to it? Jesus came to die. On he the came to die. Okay, all of these things and everything that you've ever heard about the gospel, you're right about it, but it's all connected right here with this word blessed. Because when God spoke to Abraham and he said, all nations will be blessed through you, through you, he was actually declaring his eternal global purposes for mankind. Amen. Now, you might look at that verse and say, man, how could you get all of that out of there? Well, we're going to find out that this verse has a lot in it. Let's look at what God said to Abraham. The Lord said to him, and also, just think about this for a minute. God talked to this guy and he heard him. Did you know God talks? Some people nowadays say, well, God doesn't talk. Well, he does talk. The very first thing in the Bible says God spoke, right, to create things. At the very end, he's talking. All through the Bible, God's talking to people. Now, that doesn't mean he's gonna hear, you're going to hear his voice like you hear mine every day. But God communicates. God is alive, and he made us to be able to communicate with him. So Abram heard the Lord. By the way, Abraham was not a spiritual guy necessarily. He lived in a place where they were idolaters. And he, uh, but God saw something in him and God spoke to him and he said something to him. Here's what the Lord said. He told him, go from your country. Leave Iraq. It wasn't called Iraq then, but leave this place. Your people, your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. He didn't even know where he was going. God just told him, go. God does that in our lives. We're on the way somewhere we've never been before. Then God said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Hmm, sure talking about blessing a lot here, isn't he? 
I will bless those who bless you. All peoples and all peoples on earth are going to be blessed through you. Now, I wonder when God said, especially that last thing to Abraham, if he thought, how in the world am I going to be a blessing to everybody in the whole world? I think if I were Abraham, I might have thought something like that. I mean, that's a pretty awesome thing God told him, isn't it? How did God do that? Well, Paul fortunately talks about it in the book of Galatians. He's talking about the promises spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And he says, Scripture does not say that God made these promises to seeds. Now, those of you, do we have any English teachers here? Let's see, Anthony, you're a teacher, but what's your, you're, you're a science teacher, right? Yeah. Anyhow, we know this. When a, a word has an S on the end, usually it's what? Plural. It's plural. If it doesn't have it, it's singular. singular. Okay. Now, this is, Paul is actually making a grammatical point here. He says, the scripture does not say that this promise that God spoke to Abraham was to seeds even though there is a plural aspect to it because of all of the people that are called, meaning many people, but God said to him, and to your seed, singular. This is a real important point. And who is that person, that seed? He tells us, who is it? Christ. It's Christ. God told Abraham, he gave him a promise, and he was revealing his purposes through that promise. But that was not just for Abraham. It was for his offspring also. Now, Abraham couldn't have children. His wife couldn't have children at first, could they? But God did a miracle. You know the story. I'm going to rely on, on you tonight that you know a lot of these things from your study of the scripture. But you know that he, he did have a son. It was a son of promise. What was his name? Isaac. Isaac. Okay. Isaac. But... Isaac was just one of Abraham's children. There was a next generation. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then, you probably don't remember the next generation, but it's in the Bible. If you go to Matthew, the book of Matthew, in chapter 1, it actually gives you all the generations from Abraham. It goes through Isaac, Jacob, and all, all the different ones. I can't remember them all either without looking at them. Do you know who it ends with? If you look in Matthew 1 and you get down to verse 19 after all those weird names, Old Testament names, it comes to, in, in Matthew, it comes to, or in Luke's, Luke chapter 2, it comes to Mary and then Jesus. In the other genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, it starts and it goes through Abraham and it comes all the way down to Joseph. So Jesus was a direct descendant of Abraham, who was the legal God was his father. So this is a big deal. Because all these promises about blessing and all the nations being blessed come through Jesus Christ. You know, a minute ago I said that sometimes we think that the gospel is something that's just for the New Testament times. No, it's starting clear back here. When God spoke the promise to Abraham and said that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, he was talking about the coming of Jesus. He was talking about everything that Jesus was going to do. Now, what are the things that Jesus has done and that are blessings in our lives? He forgives us. There's a good one to start with. What else? He saved us. He saved us, okay? That has to do with forgiveness. He saved us. Saved us from what? From right. From perishing, from eternal damnation, from being separated from him forever. What else? Any other blessings that you can think of that come through Christ? Healing. He heals us. Okay. Some of you have experienced healing. You said you experienced a death and the Lord brought you back. Anything else the Lord does? Prosper all of our needs. He does prosper us many times. Yes. Supplies all of our needs. 
He supplies our needs. <coughs> delivers us. He delivers us. Powers of darkness are always after us, but he delivers us. Every one of these things are blessing. But there's one thing we haven't mentioned yet, and that is that he comes and lives in us. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. When Israel was in the wilderness, God gave them the Ten Commandments. Then he gave them the law. They couldn't keep it. They tried, some of them. Others didn't even try, but they couldn't do it because it was just an outward thing. But God told Jeremiah, another person in the Old Testament, that someday God was going to make a new covenant with his people. The law that was given at Mount Sinai is the old covenant. It really doesn't change our hearts. In fact, God didn't give us that law so that we could try to keep it, because we can't. Actually, if you try to keep the law, you'll find out you can't do it. And you'll finally just throw up your hands and say, I can't do this. Because, you know, the law actually is telling us we have to be perfect like God is. And we're not. And we're not. I remember many, many years ago, my wife and I were doing some mission work, and we were in Costa Rica. And uh, you've been there. And my neighbor was a, a kind of an older guy, and we visited from time to time. And one day, he's out in his yard watering, and I went over and talked to him. And we started talking about spiritual things. And he said, well, you know, I always try to keep the Ten Commandments. He's going to tell me how, you know, he, he was interested in God, and he tried to keep the Ten Commandments. And I said, well, you know, the Ten Commandments are not just outward. Jesus said that if you um, hate someone, if you just hate them, say bad things about them, that, that's murder. And he said that if, you, if a, a man lusts after a woman, he's committed adultery with it. It's not just the written in our heart. Frustrated. And he said, well then, how can anybody be saved? And I thought, yes, the law just did its work. That's why God gave the law, so that we realize we can't do it. And when you realize you can't do it, and you realize that the penalty for your not being like God is you're going to go to hell and be separated from God forever, you start realizing, you know what? i got a real big problem here, and there's not a thing I can do about it. And when we get to that point, that's exactly where God wants us, because you know what he does then? He says, yes, but there's Jesus. That's what the law was for. But in the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied about, he said, the Lord said, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And in that covenant, I'm going to write the law on their heart. And that's what Jesus brought. When he Remember the night that uh, the Last Supper, and he took the bread and he took the wine. Do you remember what he said? He said, this is the blood of the New covenant, not just covenant, new covenant in my blood. And just a few days after that is when the Holy Spirit was poured out on God's people. And that's how we get the law in our hearts. When you were saved and the Holy Spirit came into your life, you started becoming aware lots more than you did before of what's right and wrong. You started having a desire to do what's right. You, you started wanting to please God. Your life was changed completely because now you are experiencing the blessing of the new covenant and God living in us. This is what God was talking about to Abraham. I don't know how much Abraham understood at the time. He, he probably didn't understand all that we know now, but he, that's what God was talking about. This, this new thing I'm going to do. Today, I saw something I have never seen before when I was going over this material. I want to share it with you. Now, hear what I'm saying. You're going to, you might say, oh, you're a heretic. But no, I don't think so. It, it's not like that. But I, I was thinking about the Old Testament and the New Testament and how we have a tendency to think, okay, that's from Old Testament times, and this is from New Testament times. You know what? When Paul wrote these things, when the early Christians lived, they didn't even have a New Testament. Did you know that? The New Testament didn't exist yet. 
they didn't realize that, Paul didn't realize, I'm sure, that some of the things he was writing were going to be the New Testament someday. But what that told me, what I saw for the first time is all of these things from the Old Testament, the promises of God, the promise of the New Covenant, the giving of the Holy Spirit, all of that stuff that we read about in the New Testament now actually is the fulfillment of what God was talking about clear back at the time of Abraham and all through the ages. And it's being fulfilled now. It's not a new, there's not two channels on, the, on God's TV. Okay, we're, we're, it's not two different programs where God worked in the Old Testament, now he works in the New Testament. It's all the same thing, but it's God's program moving along all through history. He's doing new things. He's revealing himself more. Now he comes to the place where the new covenant is in place and his presence is with us. He lives in us. He talks to us. We know him. And Paul in another place said, you know, we know God, but the way we know him is kind of look when you look, it's kind of like when you look in a mirror that's not very good. That's not a good example for us nowadays because we have fabulous mirrors, don't we? They work really, really well. But back in those days, they just would polish off some metal. They could get an image, but it, it wasn't a good image. And so the point he was making is that we know God, but the way we know him, it's kind of not very clear yet. But the time is coming when we will know him clearly because we'll see him face to face. Okay, let's, let's move on. There's so much here, I, I can't even hardly get out what I'm trying to say. But I want us to look at uh, Abraham to God's purposes some more in a few minutes because there's more to say about it. But, you know, Abraham was, do you know how old he was when God told him to leave and go to the, a new land? Anyone remember that fact? I know you weren't here then, but how much? 75? I think it was 75 years old. I don't know if there's, there's none of us here that old today yet even, right? Abraham was 75. Anybody? Well, I won't ask that question. Okay. <laughs> 24 years later, Abraham had another experience with God. Sometimes we think, man, Abraham was so spiritual, he had all these encounters with God. Well, he did, but so there's years and years between some of them. It's just like in your life. Sometimes God does something, and then it might be a while before you're really experiencing something again. When he was 99, the Lord, this time the Lord appeared to him. He actually saw the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him, and he said, I am El Shaddai, which means... God Almighty in Hebrew, and he told him, walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us, and I will give you many, many descendants. Now God's starting to talk about all of these descendants. You have probably read about how one time God spoke to Abraham, and he said, I'm going to give you so many descendants, it's going to be like the, the sands of the seashore. When you go to Padre Island, which I'm sure every one of you have, have you ever tried to take a few minutes and count all the grains of sand? No, obviously not. There's too many. But God said, all the descendants that I'm going to give you, and remember, Abraham did not even have any children at that point. But God said, I'm going to give you descendants, and they're going to be like the sands of the sea. And then another time he said, I'm going to give you descendants, and they're going to be like the stars of heaven. That doesn't help us too much now because we have so much pollution in our air, we can't see many stars. But if you could see all the stars, one time we were in the Amazon jungle and it had just rained and it was around midnight and it was clear. And I took salt and just shook salt out all over it. It was like that. And I thought, this is the sky that Abraham used to see. Now that really made sense, that God said, I'm going to give you all these descendants. But out of these descendants, which is plural, God had in mind one descendant, which is singular, Jesus Christ, that all these promises were going to be fulfilled through, and all of the rest of the descendants are going to be blessed through that seed of Abraham. Okay, let's... Uh, 
talk a little more about God's global purposes because this verse where God spoke to Abraham has a lot more to it than meets the eye at the beginning. One thing God did that's quite significant is that he spoke to Abraham about his global purposes with a promise and not a command. He did not say, thou shalt this. He said he gave him a promise. And a promise is actually like a mandate. Now, are you familiar with that word? Sometimes in politics, if a politician has a landslide, he says, I have a mandate to do this. It's kind of, it's not a command. It's, it's something that, it, it's an assignment that, that you're given. And the fact that God did not give Abraham this revelation as a command, but he did it as a promise, tells us that it's, it's a mandate that's to be fulfilled. Now, why did God do that? Let's come back to that one in a minute. Why do you think God did it that way? Well, first of all, he does not expect you and I or Abraham or any other believer during the ages to be able to do his work by ourselves. In fact, Jesus made it real clear. He said, without me, how much can we do? Nothing. <laughs> Nada. He said, without me, you can do nothing. So God knew from the very beginning when he gave this promise to Abraham that Abraham was not going to be able to do this work of going to the nations really in his own strength and power. God was going to help him. God was going to work through him. And who is Abraham's family now? Do you know any, of, any descendants of Abraham? Right here? Are you a descendant of Abraham? And you are too? Anybody else here a, a descendant of Abraham? Of course, we all are. Because Paul said that if we are of faith, like Abraham was of faith, then we are his children. And so his family is really big. And this mandate given through a promise was given to Abraham and his descendants. And you're a descendant. So what's that mean about you and me and this promise that's a mandate that God gave to him. Who's it for? Is it for you too? Yeah, it is. What God told Abraham, he told him something that actually was for you and me today here. I don't think Abraham knew about Texas. <laughs> he didn't know about the Rio Grande Valley with all of our nice taquerias and all that, did he? But God did. But God had you and me in mind when he gave this command. And God works through us through the Holy Spirit living in us to, to do this. One thing I'm trying to get us to see here is this thing of God working, this thing of going to all the nations, it's not our work. God is the one course, the course that we work with says that the living God is a missionary God. God is the one that does the reaching out to people, but he wants to work through us. Now, why do you think he wants to do that? Because, man, we're really pretty weak, aren't we? <laughs> The God, did Israel do a real good job of blessing the nations? No, no they, they did it. In fact, by Jesus' time, they were calling the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles, that's the nations, right? That's the other people groups that are not Jews. By the time that Jesus came, even though Israel's assignment was be a blessing to all the nations, you know what they called the Gentiles then? Dogs. That dog. Remember the Syrophoenician woman that came and she wanted the Lord to bless him? And, and the disciples wanted her to go away. And she even said, well, you know, at least the dogs come and crawl under the table and eat the crumbs. She was referring to herself with the terminology they used. They even had laws in their country that you weren't to have a close relationship with Gentiles. You couldn't even go to their house and eat. These are the people that God told them to reach. And they had laws that you couldn't even talk to them hardly. I think they got off the trail. Of course, now all of us that are God's children, we're, we're okay, right? We're doing a good job of reaching out too. Not, not as much as we should. But what I want us to see tonight is that this thing that is happening in the world of the gospel going forth is actually the work of God. And he has invited you and me to be part of it. Now, you have have or had children, little children at home, or you have grandchildren, and uh, sometimes a mother might say, okay, I want my little girl to help me clean the house. And she 
has to run around and straighten out. Why does the do that? Because she knows that she's going to not have to do any work and the child's going to clean up. She loves her child. She loves her child. She's training her child. What? Participation. There's participation. There's, there's even fellowship there, isn't there? But the parents do it because it's good for the child. I think that's kind of how God sees us. Because, I mean, <laughs> Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And we see how we fail. But for some reason, God allows us to be a part of what he's doing. Because he loves us, because we're his children, because he wants to bless us. It's part of the blessing. Because someday in eternity, there's going to be crowns, there's going to be award, uh, rewards for the things that actually God did through us. If we submit to the Lord and follow him and let him work through us, he's going to give us a reward for that. If we just do it on our own, that's the hay and stubble that's going to burn up, isn't it? But... God, and so one thing God did, and I'm going to rely on you now for this for just a minute. God, after he gave these promises to Abraham, he made a decision that he was going to form a people in the earth that he could work through. And it, it was the nation of Israel. Do you remember how that happened? It started with Abraham, didn't it? And the son of promise, Isaac, and then that family grew. It was a tribe. And what happened to them? Uh, a famine came on the land, and where did they move to? You can dig in your Bible knowledge now. Where did this group of... Canaan? Where? Canaan. Okay, they were in Canaan at the time, weren't they? But when this famine started, they had to go somewhere else to get some food. Do you remember where it was they went to? They went to Egypt, exactly. Remember the story? That's where Joseph fits into the picture. He got sent down there ahead of time. Uh, his brothers thought they were just getting rid of him, but actually God was sending him there to make preparations for them to come later. Okay, so they're in Egypt, and they were slaves. They became slaves. The king that knew them died. The new king didn't like these guys. He said, there's so many of them, they're going to take us over. We're going to, let's make slaves out of them. So now Israel finds itself in slavery, and they were slaves in Egypt for four centuries, 400 years. And then they just were so miserable. They were crying out to God, oh God, deliver us, deliver us. And so who did God raise up to deliver them? Okay, that's where Moses comes into the picture. You know that story. God brought them out of Egypt with great signs and wonders and brought them across the Red Sea. He opened that up and brought them across. How many years did they spend in the wilderness? Forty years they're in the wilderness. But all during that time, God is building something. He, built, he brought them for a, a tribe of 70 from Canaan when they moved to Egypt. And by the time they left there, 400 years later, there were millions of them. God made a nation. He did it in the fire of slavery and of difficulty, but God was working. And you know why God did it? He made a nation because he wanted them to be a light to all the other nations. God worked with them. God did all these wonderful things for them. God wanted them to be like an example that the rest of the nations would look at and say, man, what is it about you people? You're so blessed. And that did happen a little bit even during the reign of Solomon. Because remember, some of the other nations were coming there and saying, man, this is fabulous. Your God is really something. That's about the best Israel ever did. After that, they went downhill. But God made a nation because he wanted them to be a light. Okay, now we go down through the centuries. We get to the time that we call the New Testament time. God once again showed him that the Gentiles were supposed to be included. Did you know that the Gentiles being part of, of God's people, that's not a new idea. That's what God told them to start with. You are to go to all the nations of the world. Remember he said Jerusalem, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. God's heart hadn't changed. That's the same God that was talking to Abraham back at the beginning. And his heart, his purpose is to get to the nations. 
Okay, so he made a nation of people that could be a light, and that's who we are today too. We are still that light that is in the world. And now there's millions and millions and millions of us all over the world. We're not all that God wants us to be, but he still somehow is getting the job done, and he is going to complete the job. Uh, let me go back to a verse here. I, brought, I had a verse here a minute ago that I added, and I didn't get it in the right place, but I want... There we go. And now remember, we're starting with Abraham 4,000 years ago. We saw that in Jesus is the fulfillment of these promises. He's still doing it to this very day. You and I are part of what he's doing. That's part of this. But look at this verse of the Revelation. This is in the future still. Someone want to read this for us out loud? Does that sound like what God talked to Abraham about thousands of years before? It's actually God is the one who do this. And we get to participate. He's blessed us in that way. But he is going to get it done. And the end is in sight on that because the nations are being reached. Okay, let's... I'm going to run out of time. Okay, I want to touch on this. Another thing that we see in Genesis 12 about God's um, purposes is that part of what God is doing is toward God. And you'll see this on your list. I think it's number seven. seven. God's purposes have to do with himself, in part, God's pursuing a global purpose that will reconcile all things to himself. What's it mean to be reconciled? You know that word? Yeah, it means to get back together. If you have a child, let's say, that you don't have communication with, you need to be reconciled. You need to be brought back together. So reconcile or reconciliation means being brought back together. One of the things God's doing is he's reconciling all things to himself. That's toward God. That's for his benefit. God created us because he wanted to have people to love and to love him. But the fall of man messed it all up. But God, part of his purpose is getting things back. And it's for himself. God wants to be worshipped. He wants to be loved. He wants to be appreciated, just like human beings do. Okay, another thing, the things that God is doing, he's doing things for people. He's on a mission to be loved, served, worshipped by people from all humanity. That's what your calling is. You're called to love him, serve him, and worship him. And the third one is God is working against evil. He is working to accomplish something to destroy the work of the devil. I'm very concerned that when we think about it, when we say against evil, who's evil? The first son of God Almighty. He was disobedient, cast him down mm -hmm. with his angels. Mm -hmm. And we're constantly fighting, it's like the Father. But you cannot destroy evil. It's impossible. Because it's impossible for us, but God says he's going to destroy it. He, he cannot because he will destroy now, evil. Now, your, the Bible teaches he's going to destroy evil. When Jesus comes, I, I understand what you're saying, but there's some passages that God, when it's all done, is going to destroy evil. So you will destroy your own son? Sir? Would you destroy your own son? Kill your own son? 
No. I'm not here to argue that. I am saying that God's word says that when God's finished with this, he's going to destroy evil because the source of evil comes from the devil and he's going to destroy the devil. It says in the Bible clearly that Jesus came forth to destroy the works of the devil. And he's going to destroy the devil and evil in the kingdom of God when it's all finished. There's not going to be any evil. Yes, we can look it up. That's... Thank you. Thank you very much. You're wonderful, sir. All of you are very wonderful, wonderful people. Well, you're wonderful too, and God loves you, and we love God you. Bless us all because yeah. the way we're getting, you know, what? <laughs> yes, question. Some of these we kind of skipped a little bit, so well, what were you? Uh huh. Yeah, we're coming to that, so. Okay, okay here's the purpose statement. This is number eight. Bless you, brother. Yeah. 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Right, right. We were made to live. Yeah. Don't worry about that. It's this belongs to But I'm kidding. Their minds were all messed up. And we are too. We don't know everything. But uh, anyhow, by God's grace, he is going to destroy all evil. He says no evil will enter into his kingdom. And when the project is all finished, it, all of the people that have come to the Lord, they're going to be totally sinless forever in God's presence. And the, the devil is going to be out of business 100% forever. Amen. So he... Absolutely. Not the, not the of people, right. What the, what, the but, what, what the Word of God says. That's right. And uh, it's okay. We, we meet people that don't understand everything that we're talking about. And that's okay. Well, God's, we, none of us have it all figured out yet. But we do know that evil is going to be defeated. And that, that is what the Word says. Okay, we're going to finish with this. We've been talking about purpose tonight. We've been talking about God's purposes toward himself. Uh, for human beings against evil and also the fact that he has purpose for our lives because he's invited us to be part of this and we were made to live for purpose God made you to live for purpose and that's the first blank there on number seven God made you to live for purpose God himself lives for purpose we saw some of that purpose tonight. We just touched on it. I mean, it's so much more. It's huge. It's vast. But he has purpose. And the way to live with significance, how many of you want your life to count for something? Amen. Amen. Sometimes people have a midlife, midlife crisis. And I think most of the time it's because they come to a point where they think, man, I'm almost, you know, I'm 50 years old. What have I done with my life? Nothing. And it's because it's about purpose, isn't it? But the way to live with significance in our lives is to devote ourselves to a purpose that is larger than ourselves. That's what God has for us. You don't have to do what You are called to be part of the fulfillment of blessing the nations. And that doesn't mean you're going to go necessarily to another country. You might send to another country. You might send another, a missionary to another country. You might be meeting students here at the university that come from other countries that you can minister to. There's different ways that we do this, that God works through us. But the way to really have purpose and significance in our lives is to find out what God's will is for our life and to let him work in our lives. Okay, I'm... Some over, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll rush, try to go really yeah. fast. Yeah. A test. <laughs> Okay, I'll give you a minute.
so that read the question, think about it, and then I'm going to ask you. And don't worry, there's no wrong answers. <laughs> All of history. <laughs> really? Yeah. Because here he was, the, everything was pagan, and God plucked that man up and started working with him. Mm -hmm. And he had, the whole program has just been rolling since then. He's called a patriarch. He's called the father of the faithful. Like we just talked a little bit, he asked, he's our father, because he's the father of the faith. Uh, he's also called the friend of God. Would you like to have that title? Mm -hmm. Friend of God. Okay, we mentioned, Ken talked about the covenant that God made with Abraham. So that's a fancy word. What does the, What is a covenant? An agreement? An mm -hmm. agreement? A promise. A promise? An understanding with God. An understanding? Contract. Similar to a contract. Yeah. But Covenant usually is, has a spiritual aspect. It's a little, it's a deeper thing than just a contract. A binding contract. A binding contract. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's a, it, God involves you. Like when you are married, you're making a covenant between the two of you, but it's with God. And so that's why we should tremble if we're going to break that covenant, because God's involved in that covenant. Mm -hmm. Covenant still exists each and every day. Mm -hmm. Each and every day. Each and every day. Because God gave a covenant to us. He said, You will see the sun in the morning. And you will see the, the moon at night, the water. Since He said, Let's, going back to Genesis, let there be light. Light needs to come out because it's got to stay in the Lord. The light comes out. And and that's how it's the sun be. comes out. And the moon comes out. And we're here. Yeah. And so he had a covenant with Abraham that he was going to use Abraham. So in your words, can you tell us what this covenant was? That we would make him into a great nation? Yes, and that he would make him a blessing, and he would bless the nation. Through him. So that's a pretty awesome concept. But that was that in essence is what that that covenant was. Uh, well what do you guys have? What's your question? Explain how the covenant God made with Abraham discloses God's heart for every people. So what do you think, guys? So that the blessing that Abraham was having was yeah. going to go out yeah. to all the nations. God's heart has always been for all the nations. Mm -hmm. He did raise up Abraham, and through Abraham he made a people to talk to the rest of the world, so his heart has always been for all the nations. Um, what does your, your question say? It says, explain how God speaks in the promise to Abraham. It's more effective than if he had only spoken a command to Abraham. So how is that more effective? Because like sometimes when you tell somebody a command, sometimes you don't do it because you're telling them to do it and they just won't do it. <laughs> when you say a promise, then it's it's still kind of like a command, but a promise it's a little bit more lightheaded to whether, oh, okay, if I do this, I get this. So it's more chance that it won't get done. Mm -hmm. In the form of a promise, then just when, uh, go do it. When God made the promise, 
who's, who's, who's carrying the most the weight responsibility in that? is on God, not on us. Yeah. Exactly. If, if he's going to make the promise, he's going to make it happen. He lets us be part of it. What's for dinner? <laughs> no, that's not it. Describe the three dimensions of God's global purpose. It's towards God, for the people, and against people. Okay, so there was... Towards God. What does towards God mean? How how are we? How do we relate to God? God pursuing a global purpose that will reconcile all things to Himself. And what is God looking for from every people and every nation? <coughs> to be loved. Yes, to be yep. loved. Served and worshipped. How worship. do we? How do we show? What? What was that last word? Served and worshipped. Worship. God is looking for worship from every <coughs> people. That's towards God. That's part of what he wants. He wants this love relationship with every people. And what was the second one? Toward people. Toward people. And what is his intention toward people? Bendición. Bendición. Reconciliarnos. His intention, intention is redemption for all the peoples. That's his intention. And against evil? What does it say about against evil? To accomplish that the What was the verse that you said, TK? 1 John 3, 8. Uh, for this reason, uh, let me read it. The Son of Man was, the Son of God was manifested. Does anybody know it by memory? Anybody know it by heart? For this reason, the Son of Man, 1 John 3 and 8. Says, Oh, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work, the devil's work. Oh, this is, uh, let me read it in. It's because it's a different version. It's a different version. version. <laughs> yeah. I kind of got confused there. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And mm -hmm. that is one of many verses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just thinking about what that verse says and kind of what that brother was, was saying is uh, what I heard him saying is he he was concerned that p evil people were going to be destroyed. That's part of what he was concerned in because yeah. the last thing he said was, you mean God's going to destroy? Well, actually, yes. That's, that that's really part of what this is all about. God is calling us to salvation. The people that refuse God and refuse what he's provided through Christ they aren't headed for destruction. That's part of why we need to get the word out to them God because is, hell, is real. hell is real. God isn't destroying them, they're, they're choosing. And as they repent, and as those people repent, like right now, even the people from the other side of the world, and as they repent, otherwise it's their choice. Uh, that's right. God gives us the choice. We can cho I choose think, to go uh, with him. Or the go terminology and all that is what confuses people. Yeah. Because it's not God says, I'm going to kill you. It says, I place before you a choice life and death. Yes. You choose. Peace and destruction. Right. We you're, choose. <laughs> you're, you're, it's your option. Yeah. Yeah. In my opinion, we send ourselves to hell. There's, yeah. we choose God to doesn't. I think that too many churches preach uh, the feel good that God is love. God loves you no matter what your life is, no matter what your lifestyle is. Mm -hmm. what, right? We should be preaching mm -hmm. what. We just talked about what mm -hmm. we all just said. Mm -hmm. There is a hell and there's a heaven, right? Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. It's going to be up to you to decide where you're going to spend the rest right. of eternity. Right. That's right. But so many people don't want to hear because I also heard him say that we're all his creation. Yes, we are. That's true. But we're not all his children. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yep. Right? And that's mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. believing him living mm -hmm. for Jesus Christ. Yep. So, yeah. We have to be born again to become part of the family. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Well, that's 8 o'clock, so we'll stop unless you want to talk some more. I, I only <laughs> did about 5% of my stuff here. <laughs> have Any other questions Any? or comments or thoughts? How about we go around the room and just. Yep. There was nothing, you know, spectacular.
and we live, you know, in a, in a uh, world that was full of idolatry. But God's... Oh, it wasn't turned on. Brother, 